In episode two, we find out what happened in the direct aftermath of the plane crash. The girls who did survive immediately tried to get out of the plane because it was on fire. Vanessa especially was in a bad situation because she was really close to the fire and she was pinned down. She couldn't get out of her seatbelt. Shauna tried to go and save her, but Jackie, not wanting to lose two of her friends, grabbed Shauna and said, we gotta go, we gotta get out of here, leaving Vanessa. It does get a little awkward for them when Vanessa runs out of the plane and says, huh, surprise. And it's not a nice kind of surprise, it's a, hey, F you guys for leaving me here kind of surprise. When the two exited the plane, they saw the damage and the carnage that took place. Of all the people, Missy was really the one who jumped into action. She took two babysitter training courses, and I guess when you take it twice, the instincts kind of kick in. So for example, when Ben, the assistant coach, is pinned down by one of the parts of the plane, Misty finds him and, along with the help of the team, is able to free him. The problem is, his leg is completely trashed. While most of the girls are so disgusted by what they're looking at, Misty goes and grabs an axe and just cuts it off like it's nothing. Ben, by the way, passed out from the pain. Missy then walks around and makes sure that everybody's okay. When she's able to kind of confirm that all of the remaining survivors are at least good for the time being, she circles back to Ben to check on his bandages and his wound. They end up waking him up by trying to disinfect it, and unfortunately for Ben, he has no idea that he lost his leg, and the girls don't have the heart to tell him. One person, though, is missing. It's the head coach, and Javi, the coach's youngest son, is walking around screaming for him, but he's not getting an answer. The girls figure that Travis, his older brother, should probably go check up on him. Natalie runs over to let him know, hey, Javi's running around here looking for your dad, but Travis already knows what happened to his dad. He saw his dad fly out the window when his dad was trying to help one of the girls put on an oxygen mask. The door opened up, and the coach flew out. Natalie says, yeah, that sucks, but your brother is still here, so you should probably go help him. To which Travis says, maybe you should mind your own business and walks off. A little while later, the girls start looking at what items they have available to them. Vanessa is still extremely pissed off at Jackie. She feels like this team leader just left her to die. Shauna is also a little disgusted by Jackie's behavior, but Jackie tells her, for the record, I was trying to save you. All of a sudden, though, the girls hear a scream, and it's from Laura Lee. She found her bag, which is great, but Blood started dripping out of the sky, and that's when she looked up and saw her dead coach's body pinned to a tree. The girls start trying to think of a plan on how to get their coach down from the tree, and then Travis gets involved. He just climbs the tree himself, although the weight of both him and his dad end up breaking the branch, and his dad goes crumbling to the ground. Everybody looks away at the sight of their mangled coach's body. Everybody except Misty. It's worth mentioning, though, that a couple of trees away, there's a really weird carving on it. It definitely wasn't put there by animals. They bring the coach's body back to camp, and as Natalie is walking with Travis, she hands him her flask, and he ends up drinking out of it. They continue to get settled that night, figuring that they'll be there max two days. The plane has a GPS system, and it's only a matter of time before the authorities locate it and them. And one person hopes that's true a little more than the rest, and that's Lottie. She only has medication for a certain number of days. As all the girls sit around the campfire, Laura Lee starts blaming herself for what happened. She tells them that in her head, she called one of the teachers a cunt, and they all start bursting out laughing. But one by one, they start going around admitting stuff that they're not really proud they did. Most of it's just petty stuff, like stealing clothes and returning it for store gift cards. It gets around to Shauna, and Shauna's big reveal probably should be that she sleeps with Jeff. But luckily for Shauna, the whole conversation stops when they hear Ben scream. And that's because Misty heated up that axe and cauterized the wound. A little while later, Misty, in the middle of the night, sneaks off to go pee. And she overhears a couple of the girls saying how screwed they'd be if she wasn't on that trip. This is the first time that Misty's really felt accepted. Back home, she's a nerd and made fun of and picked on. But here, in this moment, she's really appreciated. It makes kind of what she does next a little understandable. She finds the black box from the plane. It does indeed have a GPS signal, but she smashes it and breaks it. Fast forward to present day, Misty, and she's on a date, but it's not going great. Seems more that Misty's into the guy than the guy is into her. And it's not like the guy looks like he has a lot of options, so... Kind of a bad look for Misty, in a way. 
The date goes so bad that Misty ends up guilt-tripping this guy to come into her house. That's how uninterested this guy is. And he looks like he shouldn't be allowed within 500 feet of a school. But when Misty and this guy, Stan, walk into her house, they find out that they're not alone. Because Natalie is standing there with that hunting rifle. You don't see it, but you know that Stan does a little fist pump in his head because that's just the opening that he needs to get the hell out of there. Even though Natalie is standing there with a rifle, Misty acts like she doesn't even see it. Natalie says to Misty, Take it, you know why I'm here. And she pulls out a postcard. And on the front of the postcard, it says, Wish you were here with a mountain range. On the back, it has the same symbol that was carved into the tree. Misty asks Natalie, Well, all right, what does it mean? But Natalie points the rifle at Misty and says, you tell me. And Misty chuckles. Because Natalie assumes that it was Misty who sent the postcards. But Misty didn't. She got one herself. Now that the two women have kind of crossed each other off the suspect list, they head to a bar where Misty starts showing Natalie all the information that she's found out about where this postcard might have came from, but also where some of the people in their past are. You could say that in her free time, Misty is kind of an internet detective in a way. Natalie's pretty convinced that whoever sent these postcards is threatening them. Through Misty's amateur detective case file, Jessica Roberts' card catches Natalie's eye. Misty informs Natalie that Jessica claims she's a reporter, but Misty's pretty sure that's a lie. Natalie then finds a poorly photocopied driver's license. She can't believe it because it's Travis's. Not only did Misty find out where Travis is, she has his phone number. And that's a big deal because Travis did not want to be found, but Misty found him. The bartender, though, interrupts the conversation, informing them that somebody bought them a drink, and that somebody is Natalie's old running buddy, Kevin. Kevin traded in his Marilyn Manson shirt for a badge. He's a detective. He can't believe he's looking at Natalie, but Natalie doesn't seem to reciprocate the same nostalgia. These two used to be best friends, but you get the feeling something happened. Kevin puts down his card and tells Natalie, if you want to get a drink, there you go. You know how to reach me. About a minute after Kevin leaves, Natalie grabs the Travis photocopy and leaves. That night, as she sits in her hotel room, with a little bit of liquid courage, she ends up calling Travis up. The guy on the other end, though, tells her, I'm sorry, I think you have the wrong number. The next morning, as she is extremely hungover, Natalie goes to leave the motel, but her car doesn't work. Fortunately for her, Misty pulls up at that exact same moment. What a coincidence. Misty asks her where she's going, and Natalie tells her she's planning on taking a trip to go see Travis. Misty offers to drive her, and with no other option, Natalie reluctantly gets in the car. Those two weren't the only one to get a postcard, though. So did Thaisa. With her campaign in full swing, she's kind of neglecting the home life a little bit. She misses a parent-teacher conference, and Simone is pretty pissed off about it. Simone fills her in on what the teacher said, and it's not great news. Sammy's having a hard time making friends and they're pretty concerned about it. Ty, however, doesn't think it's a big deal. Tells Simone, I was a loner when I was a kid. Nothing wrong with a little self-reliance. Simone, though, thinks this is something to worry about. And Simone might have a point. The next day, Ty goes into Sammy's room to read him a book, but he doesn't really seem interested. She asks him if he wants to go to the park, but he says, no, there's no point. I don't have any friends. Ty, though, stands up and says, no, let's go take a walk around the block. She goes to open up his curtains, and she finds some really disturbing pictures taped to the window that Sammy drew. When Ty asks him, why did you do this? Sammy tells her, so the woman in the tree can't see me. She watches me at night. And that's pretty unsettling for Ty. And then finally, we look at what's going on with Shauna. As she's on the phone with Callie, she gets into an accident that is completely 100% her fault. But she starts blaming the person she hit. Luckily for her, the guy who she hit, Adam, is pretty cool and chill. He laughs off the whole idea that it was even his fault in the first place. His whole demeanor, though, just pisses Shauna off. When cooler heads start to prevail, he writes down the number of a body shop that Shauna can contact and drop his name. Guy owes him a favor, he says, and he can fix the car for her. He then gives the pen to Shauna, and she writes her number down just in case they need to exchange information later on. After this little fender bender, she heads to her therapy session with Jeff. When the question of how their sex life is going comes up, they start making excuses about how busy they are. Therapist says, okay, well, let's try this out. I want you each to share a fantasy with each other that you've never done before. So when they get home that night, we start with Jeff's fantasy. He works in a furniture store, so his fantasy is to role play with Shauna being one of the customers. She's down to try it, although she's terrible at it. Like when he asks her, so what can I help you with? She says she's there to return stuff. 
Jeff then sees the number that's written down on her arm, and he asks what it is, and Shauna has to tell him about the fender bender, and he gets even more annoyed that he's just finding out that she was in an accident. It completely ruins Jeff's entire mood. The next day, as Shauna is preparing dinner, she gets a weird phone call, and it's the guy that she hit, Adam. He wants to know why she didn't call the body shop, and he knows she didn't call the body shop because it turns out Adam works at the body shop. She tells Adam, I just can't really afford that right now. And he says, okay, well, I'll do it for free if you have dinner with me. Shauna definitely contemplates it, but she tells him no. She just can't. And it embarrasses Adam a little bit, and he apologizes, but says, you just kind of seem like somebody who doesn't play by the rules. Shauna then hangs up, a little mad at herself, and she continues to prepare dinner. But that roast that she took out is not going to be thawed in time, and she needs some kind of meat to throw in that chili. So there's a dead rabbit outside. She skins it, guts it, and cooks it up. The rabbit stew is a big hit with the family until Shauna reveals that she did indeed use a rabbit outside. Both Callie and Jeff are grossed out by it, but they also don't believe that she actually did it. Later that night, Shauna tries again with Jeff, role-playing much better this time. Those two kids really get after it, like it's 1996 all over again. Afterwards, Jeff gets up and goes and takes a shower, and Shauna hears his phone buzz. And when she checks on it, It's a text message from a girl named Bianca who says, Tomorrow, usual place, 4 p.m. Don't be late. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. Make sure to be nice in the comment section. If you don't see the next video up in the end screen there, I'll get it up in a few days not to worry. And I have merchandise, you know? So go buy a mug or something. It's never too early to think about Christmas gifts, folks. Once again, thank you for checking out this recap.